All right. Welcome. Thank you for coming. And we are going to talk about Haskell and Scala. Uh, we are going to try to just compare them and see what are their both practical differences and also what are the kind of conceptual differences that uh, stand behind all the, uh, both of those languages. <coughs> Where are they coming from? Why they look? How they, how they look? and uh, where they may be even going. So, I'm Martin, I'm a software engineer and uh, living here in Zurich. Uh, some of you know me, so uh, let's, uh, and let's start. So, we'll structure the talk in a very simple way. First, we'll talk about the stuff we know, so similarities. This part of the talk also serves as a bit of a reference that if there's a Haskell programmer who wants to get into Postal Scala quickly, there are a bunch of examples you can use, like you know, a bunch of patterns that you probably know how to do. So you, you have the uh, you have the pattern in the opposite language. So this, kind of, but also it uh, it will give us some basis for comparison. So we will know what is uh, which features are in both of these languages, and then we can look at the rest and look at the differences. Second part, we will look at these big conceptual differences between these two languages. So it really sets them apart. And by conceptual differences, I mean things that are not going, which are not going to change. Okay, so these are the things which just are different. And then look at some extra features uh, uh, that the Haskell has, as opposed to the Scala hasn't. And then vice versa, some features the Scala has that the Haskell hasn't. Although the Haskell is a bit funny because there are so many extensions, and I truly don't uh, know all of them. And then we'll try to maybe end the talk with a discussion or some examination of practical considerations of using these languages in the real world in a, in a real commercial project with you know, real managers and stuff like that. <laughs> and, you know, who cares about that? Yeah, but still, it, it's going to be really boring. That's the part of it. Okay, so similarities. Yeah, so those things uh, which are similar in these languages are really a bit like that, they are very similar. Uh, on purpose, I will not be spending much or any time with syntactic differences and, and, uh, and trivial considerations like that. So there will be examples, but this, that's not the point. Uh, if you see an example, if you don't get it because you can't parse all the, all the parentheses, don't worry about it, that's not the point. The point is just to point out that, okay, this thing is here, it can be done. You can look it up later. So. I'm also not going to cover the, the basic syntactic rules or anything like that. You probably you all know it anyway. Probably, so, that's a so just a quick overview first. So all these languages are high-level functional languages, and we can then discuss what, what it doesn't mean to be functional, but, but let's let's say they're functional. They are products of uh, programming language research projects. Actually, Haskell was an uh, attempt to uh, to really produce purely functional. <coughs> very robust uh, side effect handling and it was based on ML, it was before and on this family. And Scala was an attempt to marry functional and object oriented worlds to, to, to create a language that would encompass both of the, the both types of those abstractions that the object oriented and functional styles provide. So that's interesting. Both of them have automatic memory management just like many other modern languages this is a familiar territory. Of course, we have static type checking. We are very, very, very happy about it all. I'm sure both of them have type inference, so the static type checking is not going to be asked. Great. Haskell has better type inference because it's global. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extension variant of a famous Hindemian error. I don't remember actually which algorithm exactly, but it's one of the Hindemian algorithms. Uh, so it's global. It works pretty much almost for, for everything. Scala has only local inference, which in practice means that it actually really works for all kinds of practical situations. Sometimes it with a situation that it cannot be for something, but I would say it's not a big deal. Very quick overview of uh, other basic concepts. So in all languages everything everything is an expression. Sorry, uh, just a question. Yes. What's your exact definition of global type inference versus local type inference? So a, lo a local is uh, if the type inference only works within the scope of a given closure. So you are within a function, 
and the inference plays there, and the global goes. It, try, it tries, tries to theoretically infer the types for the entire program. So basically, so, Scala is trying to solve a simpler problem. It's, it says, like, okay, this is the function, I'm going to infer the types for this function. And for example, if you have a recursive function, then it cannot infer it because, well, the function is not inferred yet, but you're already calling it, so then it gets into trouble. So, yeah, apart from the recursive example, which is a very good example, I think the local is, is more than enough in practice because exactly. everybody hates the global. So, pe people who use the global inference in industry, everybody hates them because you, you want your type annotations on top level I, symbols and interfaces. I, and I tend to agree with you, but that's why I mentioned that in practice, this is actually not a big deal at all. Yeah. And uh, I did some project in Scala and I did exactly zero times when I had problems caused by that I don't have a global type in front. Yeah. No, they yeah. haven't. Yeah. So this is actually fine. So it's interesting to see that the, you know, Haskell is alone and maybe a bit more of an academic exercise that you say, okay, we are going to go for the global one, which is a very worthy effort. Scala, they could not even go for the global one because of subtyping. Subtyping. <coughs> Subtyping uh, is not exactly very comfortable within the Milner type inference algorithm, so they just said, okay, we'll go local. Should be enough. It, it's enough. So, but yeah, good question. Thank you. So, just a very quick overview of the basic stuff that is uh, pretty much expected. You know, LPSL is an expression. There are no operators in these languages, basically, right? We have only functions. Only functions that we, that we compose and call. Uh, so, yeah. It's, just as in Haskell, you can uh, you can uh, define functions with symbolic names. Such as these, you can also define functions with symbolic names in Scala. So everything is a function. Everything is an expression. Uh, so that is to double check for myself. Yeah. You wouldn't need the the backslash is really just a part of an operator. It's not an escaping. Because on comparing the two names, and I was yeah. expecting you would use the same name. Yeah. But it's it's really not the same name that you used. It's not that you yeah. have to escape the hash. That's a type. So, both of the languages also, since they are functional, and that's pretty much, I guess, the most functionalish things about functional languages, that functions are first class objects, so that we know higher the functions, we can use functions as arguments as values, of course, <coughs> this is again very simple stuff. Just like in Haskell, you can have a function and, and supply it as an argument to a different function, you can do the same thing in Scala. The syntax is in Scala is usually more verbose, but you end up with the same effect. So it's just a uh, quick overview of that. Uh, another typical feature, again present in both languages, are anonymous functions or so-called lambdas. So we can have functions which have no name, which are just functions created from expressions. In Haskell, the very well-known syntax. In Scala, again, very, very similar. There are some variations on the theme here, but ultimately it's, it's all the same. So, And one extra thing, this is an example of a partial function in Scala. We know that we can also have partial functions in Haskell, but we are not terribly fond of them necessarily. In Scala, they can also exist. And sometimes they can be used, for example, for, for collecting uh, specific items from a list. Or something like that. So this is, this is actually a partial function that, that will match only integers and if something else comes as an input, it will say not, not defined. So that is what is the point is enabled? This, this is runtime typing that is being used. And that, yes. Is that always enabled? Yes. So you can, you can always do it. Does that mean you don't have completeness checking for the cases? You don't have necessarily completeness checking for the cases. Yeah. So no. if you sorry. Yeah. I think in match cases you do, right? You have exhaustiveness checks when you do match. Yeah, when you do match here you yeah. specifically you want Not always. to collect only the elements for which the domain is defined. Yes. What is the type of the, the last list? Uh, that would be a list of any. So since we are also living in an object oriented world, there is a type hierarchy. And everything, all the everything is a subtype of any. So this would be a list of or any or any value, any actually any, yeah. So that's for example, there's a case statement and a match statement. 
There is also. Uh, yeah, there is like the whatever expression match, and then cases, and then by default there you have exhaustiveness checks. Yeah. Oh, okay. And here, then the partial functions are you cases know. where you really o operate on something where you know you only want something to be done if the domain is defined. Exactly. Right. So what's the type of the only function behind Colat? This one? Yeah. Is, is that from any? And, and yeah, that, that's from any. And, and that be, must be from any. Because, because of the syntax, syntax yeah. or because of the left-hand side of the Colat? Must be, it has to be any because uh, the list is any, so otherwise it will not be of that. Yeah, but my question is that if just the expression on the right hand side of the column, mm -hmm. the type of that expression without the list, without the list. Is, is that already any, the type of that, the input type of that, mm -hmm. or is, it becomes any because of the list, because of inference? Good question. I think you can kind of try int, list of int. Yeah. yeah. I think it, without the list, it would probably infer it to int. On this but side. I can't survive on it. Huh? Okay, interesting. So on the right hand, is then any to option of int? Or does collect. Yeah. Collect, just, it collect is like a map, more or less, but just, you know, it only. Sorry, not a map, like a like filter, right? But uh, it will not collect things that it doesn't understand, right? So if it's undefined for something, it will not collect. Otherwise, it's like a map. Okay. Just an interesting could case. You, could you give the type signature of it? Oh, the signature yeah, is a partial yeah. function object where you can actually call is this function defined with an input parameter and it's back an undefined if not. So it's maps. So it's 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 it first. Percent. as a total function to option? No, it's actually an, a special type, a partial function type. It's a partial oh, okay. function. Yeah. Okay, now. So I guess it's something like that, that maybe. But the map is checking map first, this is functionally defined. I just mentioned it because it's an interesting thing that in Scala sometimes partial functions are there and sometimes they are used in these kind of cases. So. Now then we have uh, classic currying. This is actually the area where Haskell is very, very strong. Everything is automatically current, as we can see in the simple example. You can curry any function in Scala. Normally, if you want to have something curried, you have to specify multi-parameter lists. So you have to do it up front. Uh, luckily, there is also an uh, ultimate way to do this. So you can actually, if you have a fun function or function object which is not curried, you can call dot curried on it and it will create the curried version of that. For the first curries? curring or Sorry? first it will curry it once or or we inspect it, how many arguments does it have? It should be pretty clear of tasking about performance? No, no, what I'm asking is that if the, if the function has 10 arguments, yeah. then, then, then currying it can mean that it, it uh, uh, splits it to 1 and 9, or it can mean that it splits it to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Yeah, it will split it into, uh, into the units, so you end up with 10, <laughs> 10 different arguments, completely separate, yeah. So, it's the same kind of helper that is provided in Haskell, but the default situation is that uh, if, if you write a function, if it's not curried, it's not really. Uh, I mean, in Haskell, the uncurried is just one uncurried. Yeah. Uh, because the type checker has to be pretty clever to understand yeah. this elaborate version of, of cur uh, uncurried. Of curried. So, the conclusion here is that you can work with curried functions in Scala, but it's maybe less, slightly less common and less straightforward than you would be using Haskell because it's a maybe little more, little more quick. Uh, then I'll just mention encapsulation of the idea of encapsulation that you're hiding some information, you're hiding some, you want to have a mechanism that, that hides the implementation detail of something from something. Here yeah, Haskell has a basically a module system that uh, is used for these purposes typically. Right, so you have a module and you only export something from the module to some function and somehow inside. Scala here, due to its object-oriented roots as well, is very, very powerful. I will not go into all the examples, but you can have all these private fields and everything. You can have nested classes in nested classes. It's, it's very powerful. So you can have different, different kinds of layers where you hide 
when you hide the different implementations and you know, in a multi-layer fashion, so it's very powerful. So in this, it's actually a really nice tool to encapsulate the functionality from APIs. Then, uh, so to mention the favorite uh, thing about most functional languages, pattern matching, especially with guards. So this is something that Haskell does, has, has, and Scala can do the same thing exactly. Again, different syntax, but you can achieve the same result, or very, very, very similar result. It's possible that we could be able to find some cases which are not possible in either of those, but generally speaking, you can you can have your pattern matching in guards in both languages. So this exists as well. And of course, list comprehensions, that's a similar story, just like in Haskell or in Scala. Uh, they work in a very, very similar way, just a little more, more verbose in Scala <coughs> as usual, but the principle is the same. Please uh, note the use of the word for, the keyword for here, due to the next slide. So, now we are looking at monadic composition notation, which is uh, uh, something used a lot in Haskell for oper monadic operations. So in Haskell, they do notation in Scala, they have reused the for notation for the same purpose. So same notation for list comprehension and monadic uh, composition of syntactic sugar. So it looks, actually, just quickly search. Yeah, so this is the still the list comprehension <coughs> and the monody composition looks very, very similar. So now we are now we have the code examples because that's probably a bit long, but uh, also uh, concerning the type system. These languages support generalized algebraic data types, parametric polymorphism, polymorphism, adult polymorphism, polymorphism. Here the situation is slightly different. In Haskell, adult polymorphism, as you know, is primarily achieved by using, by using type classes. And in Scala, you can do type classes, but there is also, again, the object oriented infrastructure available. So you can do standard method overloading, subtyping, all these things. Uh, Multi-parameter type classes are also available, and functional dependencies can be done a little bit more verbosely than in Haskell, but it's possible. So just to kind of overview: where are you, where are we standing, or what we can do with both languages? And in continuation of that, so in both of the languages, we have compound types. We have type alias. We have existential types. We have higher order types, so-called so kinds. So, as you can see, in both cases, very rich type system, or very rich type system, at least, uh, that can be used to our advantage. Just a quick, exa quick example of algebraic data types. This is something that's in, that in Haskell is very nice and very clean. In Scala, it's more verbose, because it's not completely native to the language, but it can be happily emulated using so-called case classes. So these two snippets are equivalent to the same. Uh, it's the modeling of the tree uh, as algebra did that, but in Scala it's a bit more. Uh, you can also notice here is the seal trait. This is to prevent prevent any other subtyping from the tree trait. So we know that uh, we are exhaustive. If we match against the uh, against the algebra that type, we can do exhaustive match. We know that there are no other other classes that would appear somewhere from some library. Is there a difference between interface and trait? Or? There are no interfaces in Scala specifically, but it's interfaces, trait is like an interface from Java, but it's uh, more powerful. So trait is basically like a class, but you cannot, it can have a, cannot have a constructor, and that's the only thing it can have. Uh, otherwise, it can have everything. You can have members, you can have ty abstract type members, you can have you know met methods, you can have fields, everything. So. Basically, I would say trait is the, is, the, is the primary building block of the objects in Scala, right? 
If you say a trait is like a class but cannot have a constructor, what would a field then help? I mean, they use usually for mixing mixing compositions. So you have a trait, you implement some some methods in a trait, uh, okay. and uh, you put it together and you put some class, and then you have some sort of nice uh, composed object. So or just like an interface as well. So is that very similar to the abstract class then? Sorry? What's, what's missing for that to be the same as the abstract class in Java? Yes. The difference between the abstract class and the trait is exactly that the abstract class can have a constructor. Can it? Oh, but, the, but you're not allowed to instantiate the Yeah. But you can actually instantiate the trait. Uh, uh, <laughs> so. So it can do almost any, everything except that one little thing. Okay. So usually, like if you look at libraries in Scala, it's full of traits, and there is a class here and there somewhere lying around. So that's how it looks. So fundamentally, <coughs> this is going to have quite a bit different representation at runtime, right? Whereas the, the Scala version is just going to be a pointer, and yeah, this is wrong. probably the, that's this is going wrong. to contain some pointer to some runtime type information, like J, I mean, it's based on JDM, right? So it needs to have a to point of pass. And on that, on that information, you're going to do the matching, the case matching, right? Yeah. Whereas Haskell is going to just have, have it all, you know, the, 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 basically the bit which constructor is, is going to be inside this, this uh, kind of object, this memory, right? For, for either empty or null. Yeah, it should be like that. Although, hmm, I'm not quite sure there might be some clever optimizations going on there. Since this is sealed, so the compiler knows that you will have no more subtypes, it might be able to optimize this heavily. So I don't quite remember that, but there are a bunch of things like that around the compiler, so. Do they do any pointer tagging? I don't know. So here we have the oh sorry, a little bit favorite pattern. Type classes. So just to show how they are done, this is a classical type class in, in Haskell and how it's used here. And this is again the equivalent of Scala. So this can be uh, achieved very easily. Again, this is unlike in Haskell that the type class is not inherently the feature of the language. But it uses uh, implicit parameters to achieve the same effect quite successfully. So it actually works really well. What about checking that type classes don't overlap? Yeah. Sometimes, in, I mean, in Haskell, I use type class where I really rely on that, that it, wherever it's picked, it's going to be the same yeah. implementation. So what happens in Scala is that actually, unlike in Haskell, you don't have a global scope for type classes, but since you are capable of importing some objects which will implement the type, type class, like this, right? Okay. This, maybe it's not here, maybe it will be in another library. You can to some extent you can actually control what you import. And as far as the conflicts go, if you import two things which are in conflicts, the compiler should uh, should throw an error. So there is a there is a so-called implicit resolution mechanism. And there's that mechanism, if it's not happy with the result, if it's not deterministic, then it will complain. And then you can specifically, you can solve it by specifically importing or unimporting the given thing that you don't want to write. So this is actually quite nice. You can really say, okay, I want this type class from this file in, di in this scope, in this, in, only in this closure, for example. So you can use a different instance of, 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 a, type, of a type class in different closures. For the same kind of type class, should you choose to do so? I think that sounds, that sounds very, terrible. very hard to program against. Nobody does that. Yeah, I'm just saying you can do it. <laughs> yeah. So what you do, if, I, if I have a set and I create in one module that well, uses one instance and then pass it to another module that uses different instances yeah. and all helpers. Exactly. So oh. I'm not saying anybody's that doing that, but should you get into a situation when that would be necessary, it's possible. I also never done, I have never done this. So I've always treated the, my dev classes just like in Haskell, pretty much globally. Right. Um, yeah, and there are some additional features that both languages have, but we don't really have to look closely, like implicit parameters which are already <coughs> in this way. 
There are some annotations you can use in the code. There is a compile time meta programming involved in template Haskell in Scala. There are macros. This is for I think I was code probably too technical and but it's just good to know it's there. And now we are going to look. So this was just the overview of what we have. So as you can see, if you're a Haskell programmer or if you're a Scala programmer, there is lots and lots and lots of stuff that you already know, which is there in the in the other language. It's probably there in a slightly different form, maybe with some small surprises, but it's there. And you can use it. So that's good. So those are the two benefits. Now differences. So first, the obvious one: purity, right? Haskell is pure, or tries to be pure. We have referential transparency. Side effects are always modeled, or should be always modeled, by monads, and functions are are pure. In Scala. The design goals are different. They basically, as I understand it, based on what I read and based on what I heard, this was not really a goal. So when they were designing the language, they said, like, "Okay, we are not going to, we are not going to deal with this whole side effect thing." So as a result, just just as many other languages, there are no reference to the guarantees. You can have side effects anywhere. So we we talked earlier that everything is expression, right? But in Scala, what can be an expression is that you have a block of code, and the last last expression in the block of code is a value of the entire block. So you can do print, 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 fire missiles, print, print, and then return a tree. And that expression would have a, a value of three, right? But you can have those side effects anywhere. That's, that's awesome. So the functions cannot be considered pure, not at all. There are no... There are no... Uh, mechanisms or, or features in the language that would be built in the language to, to model or even limit the exposure to the side effects or there is no anything like oh I want to annotate this function to, to tell the compiler that this is really pure or this is, this, is, this is completely pure, there are no side effects to this day there is no such thing I have heard about plans that they are planning some sort of effect system now but we have to see how that is going to work out and Haskell, as you all know, this is Haskell Meetup, so this is all quite nicely modeled. So this is really a big difference, right? If you, if you are deciding between Haskell and Scala, this is probably the first thing to consider. Okay, do I want to be pure or not? Or is it okay for me to not to go with non-pure language or, or not? Then there is a difference uh, in the evaluation strategy. I consider this to be a, less of a problem, although some people would uh, argue with some random characteristics and how the system behaves, it could be an issue. So, default evaluation strategy in those languages is completely opposite. Haskell has a non strict, lazy evaluation strategy and optionally using some constructs such as bank patterns or strict modules in the new, uh, new version 8, you can force the compiler to evaluate eagerly. In Scala, it's the, exactly the other, the other way around. So it's very traditional, we have eager evaluation, like in almost all classic <coughs> languages. And there are some ways how you can make the evaluation lazy for a specific function or specific piece of code if you want to. So this is a, just a difference in a, in a default mode. I would say Haskell is a bit more flexible here because using the, the new feature with strict modules, you can make the entire module strict. You can't make the entire module lazy installing the entire class or the entire package or whatever piece of code you are interested in. So, so this is one difference. I think it's also such that the Haskell runtime system, I mean, as it has been designed for lazy computation, yeah. uh, can deal with lazy evaluation more exactly. efficiently. One quick example is that you want to make sure that if you evaluate it, you remember the evaluation so that the second evaluation will just use the result. Uh, and in Haskell, this is done such that there's an indirection which is later eliminated by the knowledge collector. So, in the end, you really just have to value the value to. Yeah. Whereas the lazy evaluation in, in Scala has to keep the indirection. Uh, when I looked at the, what the JVM, because Scala from, from the onset, they wanted to have a good interoperability with Java. This was actually a design goal. And if you look at the internals of the JVM, what it can do, and if they try to do the lazy thing on the JVM with all the other things they have been doing, I think it was probably a sensible decision on their side to say, okay, we are not doing this because it would be difficult or 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. But it's just something yeah. to keep in mind that yeah. if you do lazy data structures, you have an additional penalty to pay for yeah. if you do it in Scala. Yes, yes. Just a question. Uh, what about uh, data structure evaluation? Are there some things like uh, infinite data structures in Scala? So, there are some, but they are, I would say, they are well separated from the rest of the library and rest of the collection framework. So, if you have an infinite data structure, you definitely know you have an infinite data structure. These are called uh, streams, if I'm not mistaken. So we, you can work with them, they are there, but yes, you are paying some penalty for that. Yes. But you can do it. So can you do like a pointer comparison in Scala? Pointer comparison? Yes, I have two objects. That can I say, you know, check for equality of the object, like pointer equality, not, not logical structure equality? Strictly speaking... So, so you can tell us the problem. That's a trick question, actually. <laughs> so. Oh, really? So you mean in terms of reference, reference type? I mean something like in Java, you have yeah, two things that are equal, you know, operator, right? Yeah. One is doing pointer, pointer, the other one is doing like logical. Yeah, yeah. it's also like triple equals or yeah. something like that. So Scala has, does it have the equal equal thing? So the normal equal equal in Scala yeah. is the, not the pointer equality, okay. but the full on equality. Okay. But theoretically, I never tried it, you might be able to actually call the original equality, like the very top one from the very top object from the hierarchy that actually does the pointer equality. So that might be possible to call that. Yeah. If you do like super super and then call it. But, then yeah, it. So but normally, true. normally you don't, like yeah, normally you don't have that at your disposal, the pointer equality, no. The equal equal operator actually operates on the object ID. So okay, so that's... Every object has a unique ID. So Alright, so that will work. So that's kind of the object ID. Oh, oh, it is reference equality then. Yeah. Right. Okay, interesting. So, how is the structural equality then called? So, the one, the Haskell equality, like where you really go down and do everything. Or does it not. So, yeah, the answer is the question. Yeah. Implementation is specific to the data structures. Yes. So, you have to implement the equals contract, mm -hmm. which is highly uh, specific to the database. Yeah. yeah. So, my my it's actually a nightmare. Yeah, it's a bit of a. This is actually one of the, like this whole equality thing, this is one of the, I think this is actually the worst design decision they made because there are, there are also types that are not quite sound there because I, I can show you later, it's actually the, the biggest screw up about the entire scholar, I would say, or one of the biggest. But yeah, sorry, I misunderstood the whole question. So yes, you have the equality and but depending on the implementation, you might have, might want, might have a deep comparison. Yeah, it was, it was the opposite. So. But normally I would say, I guess uh, if you call the EPO operator, you would only expect uh, the reference equality. Nothing special happening, normally. Uh, the other reference is, uh, of course, control flow. So Haskell is declarative. You don't have any go tos or anything like that. You can't jump off. <coughs> Exceptions are not part of the language. They are modeled by Monad. So Control flow is uh, in the hands of the runtime. In Scala, you still have some classic in productive constructs, so you have classic exceptions, although you also have monadic exceptions. So there are people, for example, who write Scala libraries who don't really use the classic exceptions. They, they use, them, use the monadic form. And but they, they, are, they are there. Haskell also has exceptions, no? But usually, the, you try to also model them in natively Haskell supports. So the IO it's model, essentially, is, is Haskell's imperative equivalent. And there you have exceptions and okay. threads. You have, uh, so you have all the control you're used to from sort of oh, C then. or C++ land. And uh, there's one, one more weird thing that really shouldn't be, be there, in my opinion. There's still a return call in Scala. So if you're in the middle of a function, in the middle of the method, you can call a return and like, return early in an unstructured way. It's like go to do the end of the function. Is, is this somehow reflected in the, in the type inheritance or type information? Uh, that I don't know, but uh, what I noticed is that nobody ever uses that return keyword ever. It's just there, looming, but everybody's trying to avoid it. It should probably be such that every code path that returns from the function has to return the same type. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, yes, though. But uh, it's that uh, when, when it comes to control, control flow, you should have this shortcut. This middle return is a very easy rewrite on the ESC. 
it's nothing. Yeah, it's not. It's nothing. Yeah, it's nothing manageable. It's just there. Still, I I expect this to be deprecated at some point. But it's still also an expression, right? Return five is, is an expression. I I'm afraid it's a special oh, okay. thing. It's it's keyword and it does the really. I mean, yes, the five is the expression. Yeah. But the return is the special. It's like throwing an yeah, exception. Sure. If you, if you, if you would say that it's just an expression, then if yeah. you put it in the middle of that, then it doesn't. Yes, no. I was thinking. That's exactly. Was, the uh, what I <laughs> so this is exactly the good, good example. So, for example, if you, what happens is you are in, inside of the method, and you are you are fiddling around with some with some functors that you are mapping and flat mapping and doing things, and inside of some of the closures, inside of some lambda, you put return. It's gonna return from the entire oh. outer me method, so it's like really bad. That's why nobody does that. Oh, then it's yeah. not an easy thing, right? No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not nice. Yeah. So that's one thing to one thing to watch out. If you see a return in a Scala code, just just get rid of that. So there's okay. actually a, <laughs> there's actually a static, a static type checker that actually that they will disallow that. Right? So what happens if I have a closure and it contains a return and I return it from the method and then this gets called? Where is it going to jump? I think it's where I'm going to jump out from the method that it's currently being called from. Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, it's, it's, so it's going to be different depending it's on... It's orthogonal to the whole closure business, right? So we have all these closures and everything and so it doesn't respect... So you just want to look at the stack and pop the first Pretty much, yeah, oh, that's, that's what it does. How is that typed? I mean, this way, yeah, it can not never be typed in. Yes, that's the problem. So that's one nasty thing that they should fix. Here you have to the bomb. Yeah, mm -hmm. here we have the bomb. Yeah. No, why not? You, you just have to use the same type as the whole function. No, 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 the, no, the, no, the, no, 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 Yeah, that is strange, maybe. But this bomb is actually this bomb is actually not the really bad one. The really bad one is the equality because equality um, method or function is not properly typed. So it actually accepts as an argument any type. Yeah. Oh, really? yeah. like Java. <laughs> exactly like Java. So this is this is this was the mistake they did. It's Java. It's not like Java. It is Java. Yeah. This is the mistake they did. Probably to probably to make the Java interim easier, and now they figure try to figure out how to fix it. But they didn't yeah. compile to bytecode, right? The yeah. Java. Actually, it's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Type system is not Java for some of the runtime right. duration. It's not done in Scala, so it's quite more robust. So, for example, in, in, in Java, you can have the type hints for all types of collections <coughs> only present at, yeah. at compile time. So. Right. No, this is purely this is purely basically a feature standard of the standard library. So they, you know, they introduced this this top object and they said, okay, the equality method accepts any instead of accepting the same type as your object as, as your instance is, right? So you can theoretically theoretically you can implement an equality that will say, oh yeah, these two things these two things which have a completely different types even outside of the type hierarchy are equal if you implement it wrong. The compiler will not be able to prevent it. That's what I'm saying, right? So that's actually the, the yeah, problem. But, but it was like this in Java, and they wanted to be compatible. So the end <laughs> wants to be compatible to object, right? Yeah, that was probably the motivation, and they kept it like this. But now I think they're. I, I read some some blogs that they're trying to figure out how to fix it. So we'll see what happens. Probably going to be very difficult because well, APS. So, so these are the two big, basically the big uh, gotchas like, oh, return, shit, but the static type, type checker can take care of that, so that's okay. But this equality thing, hmm, that's actually really bad. Static type checker can do nothing about it because this is the API that they provide. So, yeah. Okay, so these are like uh, just an overview of really big differences, including of some uh, not so nice things in Scala design actually. And now we can just do a quick look at uh, overview of some ha features the task will provide, some extra features. There are too many of them, so I just listed some of them that I find interesting. So you have the point tree style, which is ubiquitous. 
uh, this is certainly not the case in Scala. You can do a bit of point free there, but not really. You just basically use to have to use a parenthesis most of the time. And you have type voting rules that have developed in inference. You have support for higher rank types, which is really nice. Kind inference works perfect properly. This is a problem in Scala, it doesn't really work. Uh, that plus the driving mechanism, which is very powerful, and many more extensions. I, I don't even know there are, so, there are too many. So Haskell has even, I would say, goes even farther to the, uh, the to the higher abstractions and to more powerful abstractions as much as it goes. <coughs> uh, I will talk a bit more about Scala features because this is Haskell meetup. So there's a good chance that people here know these things, but they know maybe less about the extra features that Scala has. So. We'll just show some examples. As we already mentioned a few times, well, it's a multi-paradigm language, whatever that means. So you have imperative programming, actually. If you think that's a good idea or not, you can do your values, you can have mutable state, you can have code blocks and all that, just like in any in the imperative language. You see here, uh, there is a side effect, and there is an exception being shown, and you can, you can do all of that. You can mutate the variables. So, so by default, all, all variables are immutable and most of the data structures are persistent? Sir? So by default, all the variables are no. immutable? Uh, how it works in practice is that pretty much all libraries, including the standard library, everything is immutable. Yeah. So you just have this option to sit in a tank and start doing things and creating havoc, but basically everybody is gently pushing you not to do it. That's kind of the feeling of when you are when you are using the, the language, right? So, uh, and I'm actually surprised to be honest. Uh, when Scala was released, it was kind of like, okay, so what is it? So is it like functional or is it like imperative? Or like what's going on here? And what the community did, everybody went like heavily functional. So like, oh, there is this cool thing in Haskell. Let's let's implement that, right? Or let's emulate it, or let's try to improve on it. Actually, so I would say the mindset of people who use Scala is very, 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 very functional, and this is good. So you were rarely, mm, I had another project, we, we had a, you know, two, two years of production code. I think there was, there was one var in the entire code base, and that was only because I was tired and I was doing this algorithm and I was just like, okay, I know the iterative way how to do this. And I never bothered to rewrite it into fault. But yeah, that's still, that was I think the only one. Everything was in the table everywhere. So that's how it normally works. And again, there are also, and this is something I recommend to people, there are static type checkers which are easily integrated into, into the compiler that will not allow you to use bars, for example. So they can actually turn off the imperative part. <laughs> Suddenly you can use it. So that's actually good. You can, you can so you're saying house code doesn't have mutable state, but what about the ST model? Yeah, you, and you, you, can, you are emu I mean, natively, right? So you are emulating the state with mana, but it's. Uh, it's very well modeled. It's, it's, it's hidden in the mind, right? So the, the reason why I'm mentioning that yeah. is, is that I mean, mutable state is a crucial feature to implement some algorithms or data structures efficiently. Yeah. It, it yeah. doesn't work without. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, to me, the statement is a bit too strong to say Scala has mutable state, Haskell does not. And no. even in Haskell, you can sort of, if you want, for some subpart, you can switch to mutable state, yes. wrap it all up, and make it uh, pure. Let me rephrase. Scala has mutable state very natively, so it's easy, easy, easy to, to get it, right? And Haskell, it's a slightly more evolved exercise, but you can get it anyway, anyway yes. Has your statement been proven yet? Which one? That there exists an algorithm which can be. Oh, yes, it's the uh, Union Fine. Oh, okay, proven? No. But there's a good candidate which is the Union Fine data structures. But it's like just nobody was able to do it. And it's not like they do it. So I, I don't know the status, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What well, about the wrap algorithm? Wrap so I have to find a three functional version that is just sufficient. Mm. Yeah, I was aware of examples. I was right. just imagining there is maybe a sign glass of it. Because I agree that, of course, you need state, like that's why we have all of these models and everything. You need state, you need IO, right? You have to model it somehow. It's just a question how do you model it? How close is it to the core of the language, right? So in Scala, it's, it's right there if you need it. In Haskell, it's a bit more wrapped. And that's, that's the difference, right? 
of course you can get the same effect and you need the same effect because you need to do something specific or IO or algorithm. Yeah, so it's definitely nothing to encourage or put very forward, but I, I wouldn't say that it's more really more honors or so to use that it's one of them. Yeah. I guess it's more explicit, right? Because if you have more a viable yeah. then your reading it is is a separate you know, expression. If you very explicit that you're reading something and you're writing something whereas you know, in yes. here you, you can just mention mutable in an expression and that's it. Yeah. Yes, right? so it's, it's more. This, 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 it's, it's more. It's more. Yes, but sort of the runtime <laughs> system feature, mutable state, yeah. is nicely. So actually, Scala is more better than stable because you can compose pure and pure code. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, uh, I mean there's this duality between expressivity and yeah. uh, ease of reasoning about it. Yeah. And definitely, the thing that cannot do anything is very easy to reason about. It doesn't do it. And by the way, just to like you know about the state, like one remark, of course. There's nothing wrong with state when it doesn't go to places when it should, shouldn't be, right? So if somebody implies an algorithm within the function that uses mutable state and doesn't go outside of the function, yeah, but you never know fine. what's the what's the scope of your application or even your function. That's that's an actual problem. So well, that's when it's exposed, then you have state. Yeah, you know what I mean. You know, you never know where your function is used. So yeah, but if you're only using a state for internal variables, then you really should find yeah, it. Then it's then because you know, let's say it's a typical example of loop. I'm looping. I have this kind of counter that is not exposed anywhere. It's not exported anywhere outside of the function. Then I can happily have my state. It's fine, right? Right. And in Haskell, what you could do is, is just have a pure function, but internally you can use the ST model yeah. and actually have like an array that is mutable. Yeah. Mutate it as much as you can, and then the type system is going to make sure that you don't actually need any of that. Right. So it's actually still a pure function. Just not <coughs> are those uh, immutable um, data structures um, are they implemented persistently as a in persistent Which ones? Like the, list? the list one, two, three, for example. List one to three is this immutable. Is, this that's immutable. immutable. Right? That's immutable. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of standard list that you list. It's also a persistent data structure because it's the only way nowadays to have uh, also a yeah, performant uh, performant data structure. This is this is implemented persistently. What do you mean by persistent? Yeah, this is the data structure. I think uh, that that, 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 uh, that reflects all the all the alterings in the past. Ah, that. So is it a function of pointers? I don't think so. I don't think so. This is a this is a very ordinary list. Well, if because you because the alternative is just uh, yeah copying, and this is really a bad alternative. Yeah, of course. So yeah, the answer to your question is. I use the very, very most ordinary list in all of the examples, yeah. which is actually something that nobody really uses in production. So, it's the, so this is just the ordinary linked list that is, if you if you add something around, it's going to be copied. Yes, it's very dumb. Oh, really? Okay. But this is no, it yeah. won't be copied because it's immutable. Okay, so if you prepend, it's okay. If you if you try to exchange something, then you have to make so it. So maybe I'm misunderstanding the vocabulary you guys are using. Mm -hmm. The way I understand it is, if data such as is persistent, then it doesn't tell anything about performance characteristics. So say I have a map, right? Okay. And it's persistent. So which means the way I understand it is that if I say you know insert five, then what I'm going to get is like a new version of the map, and the old version is still accessible. Right, right. That's and whether this, this insert only copied the spine of the tree or whether it copied right. the whole so map doesn't matter. It's common system. denominator sharing, so the common part is shared between all the accessors. Yeah. The but is this the requirement of persistent data structure? What is the definition of persistent yeah. data structure? I thought that they really did. If I copy everything, it's still persistent. It's just that the old version of the data structure it's is still there. accessible. Yeah. Right, that, that's yeah. what yeah. I thought this is the definition. Then you have so yeah. the compass is an ephemeral data structure. Mm -hmm. Where only is not it exists. It's in the air for some time, and then you change it, and poof, the yeah. version is not. Okay, but then what is the difference between immutable and persistent? It's I like think data so structures are orthogonal. Or? No, no, my point was just that um, immutable data structures can be implemented efficiently they can. in a persistent manner. I see what you mean. And I hope that they implement it in yeah. a persistent way. <laughs> to I, I think you should be, I mean, uh, what I'm saying is that I think uh, if I have a list or, or a map, right, and it's something, and you get a new map, I have now two maps, but right. whether, whether they share something or not, 
it's persistent because the old right. version is, is, uh, so is there. The whether, whether they share something yes. is just an optimization, right? It doesn't, it doesn't influence whether it's persistent or not. Okay, but if we define persistent like this, then it's the same word as immutable. Sure, yes. That's what, that's what, that's what I was that's what basically saying, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying here. Persistent is because the old stuff is there. It's the difference between different yeah. communities. Like I'm just not 100% sure that the, that the word has no meaning that we are not aware of. But yeah. Okay. Okay. That's why I was asking about vocabulary, because that's, that I was slightly confused. So I don't know exactly how the implement, implementation behaves, how clever it is, but it's immutable. That's, that's in the contract. And then for list, there's definitely structural sharing. Structural sharing, yeah. It's okay. So, in Scala, I'm, uh, uh, is also as an extra to impress programming, we have some object-oriented programming or object-oriented constructs, and these are very classical ones. If you know languages like, like Java or .NET, of course, so it's a classic subtyping-based uh, OO system, class-based inheritance, classes, object traits, all these things. I don't want to spend uh, much time on that because well, that's very similar in, in all of these languages. In Scala, maybe what, one thing I would point out that this all object oriented system of Scala is very flexible. So you, you, really, you can really compose things very, very easily. It's very nice for composing, nesting everything, multiple heritage and everything. So it's, that's, that's nice. So as far as the object oriented systems or OOP support languages goes, this is a nice one. Uh, then we have some extra useful syntactic sugar or features such as for example name and default arguments. So that's helpful sometimes. You can name your arguments, you, you can specify the default values, sometimes useful. That's easy. Uh, this is actually a feature that can be really easy but it's extremely useful. I know there are some libraries or templates in Haskell that can do this. Same thing in replication. So basically you can form strings by just starting the interpolation and then embedding the variable into the string. This is kind of like a parallelish idea. Uh, the good thing is that it's programmable. So these interpolators, such as S or F, are part of the standard library. This is not encoded directly into the language. And you can, uh, you can uh, create your own interpolators. And is that string first? First class in the sense that can I use this for translations? Which uh, so the, in the first example after yeah. the yeah the vo volume substitution equals to s is need yeah can I put is need into a variable as a string and read it from a translation file and then interpolate mm, because that's no. the practical use yeah. case for it I don't think that would work. So this, this, is, this is already on the language level, so uh -huh. no, that wouldn't work. Why couldn't this S substitution thing go and then it has this key, key that is neat, and then it needs to go and do the substitution? Instead of that, it would go redefine and then look out yeah. the current language. Yeah. So oh. it has to be in the source code. And then uh -huh. But I actually don't do what you're suggesting. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good idea, but I don't think you can do it. Uh, but the nice thing is that you can also program your own uh, thing interpolators. So, for example, there's a library that uh, has, a, has a JSON document string interpolator. So, you just specify your JSON document into these triple quotes, and suddenly this data type of this is not a string, it's a JSON something, right? It's a JSON object. So, this is quite nice. Can't you do the same kind of thing with quasi quotations? Quasi quotes in Haskell? In Haskell, I think it's possible, yeah. yeah. But I never tried it. Then so. it would be actually more powerful because quasi code you actually define the parser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like there you are going, like that, that's basically the idea that there you are going deep, deep into it because you are doing already some meta programming, right? And here this is just like uh, basically you implement one little interface and you can have your interpolator. And it's, it's just really this actually this is a completely orthogonal feature to, to everything else. If you take all the design decision decisions about Scala, this has nothing to do with anything, but it's so useful. So that's why I'm showing it's just so useful. Everybody uses it all the time. So it's one of those little things that. Really help. Then I already mentioned this a little bit. Uh, there is flexible scoping, so maybe compared to some other languages which are mm. kind of object oriented or hierarchical. Uh, in Scala, the rule of thumb is that 
if you are wondering if I, if you can put that function into that class or if you can put that class into that object, you can put anything pretty much into anything. And it works. So it, it doesn't come back. You can nest basically everything. This is not necessarily true in all languages and so you can really nest anything. So this is quite nice for again for structuring your program in a way that is that is useful for you. So this is this is something I actually just uh, personally really like really like. Uh, then there is this honey feature, something to be maybe a little wary about, if you, if you see it. It's called implicit conversion. We already touched implicit parameters. I think you know how that works. If there's a parameter in scope, it's... Uh, but this is an implicit conversion, so how it works is that if I have a function that accepts something like an int, and I try to call it with a vector, is a, like a list, right? It's a collection. Well, that wouldn't work, of course, except if there is a conversion function in the scope and it's marked implicit, and it happens to turn the vector into an int, the compiler will look for the implicit conversion function and it will convert it. So this is like a programmable weak typing, kind of, right? So this is like PHP turning your you know, string into an int behind your back, but this is not behind your back. You can, you can control it if you want to have such functionality. But I'm just saying that uh, this is something that people sometimes overuse, and that's not a good thing. If it's not overused, then it's really useful for libraries. Some libraries use it to, to, to produce a, a lot of magic and really, really cool constructs. But just, I would be careful about it. Excuse me, uh, what will be the, when we got uh, multiple functions, conversion functions? <coughs> yeah, I think it would complain that you that it can't decide. There is this again, there's this implicit search algorithm, and that's deterministic, so it has to find the one thing. Yeah. Uh, what, but what is possible is that this implicit search goes from the lower, from, from the closest scope outside. So if you have something that's different, different implicit instance, on some outer scope, it's just gonna grab that one in, the, in your local scope and in the outer scope. Yeah. But if you have the conflict with ones in one scope, then, okay. then there is a problem. Can it chain implicit conversions? Yeah, sorry? Can it chain implicit conversions? Uh, Will it do more than one? Will it do more than one? It should be able to do that, but I have to check. You whether it, whether it yeah. looks for an implicit conversion to, let's say, do type yeah, A to but type then, B and then look for type No, that's actually C dangerous. No, wait. C, wait. No, 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 wait. No, I can't imagine. Because then you can you can get into cycles or whatever. Yeah, well, what about like built-in uh, implicit conversions like in C++ there's something similar when you have implicit language level casting from let's say integer to float and then mm -hmm. you have an operator which converts something to integer. Ooh. If I'm not terribly mistaken, all of these things are Scala actually implemented in a standard library, so they are not built-in. That's that's exactly the thing. So they're a proper implicit conversions. So. And that's nice. That's that's one thing that's nice. So there is no magic going on with numbers inside of the language, right? You can always even like you can always even disable the magic, or you can kind of try to tweak it if you don't. Like. One interesting feature of Scala, as many people don't know, structural typing. So basically, anonymous anonymous types. I can uh, I have a function, and I require some sort of type, and I don't have a nominal type, and I have a name. I just say, okay, this type has to have a function size. And that, so I'm just specifying the structure. I can, of course, specify a bunch of, bunch of these functions. I just only, I only use once. So this is like anonymous interface? Yeah. It's a yeah, it's anonymous a interface or does it supply? Would it be okay if it has more methods than just size? Totally. You can, you can put the entire huge uh, trait or... Oh, exactly. It has, has more, yeah. <laughs> No, so you can specify, like, you can basically, let's say somebody has written a class and you would cut off the head of the class, the name, and just put, take everything that, or not the class, the interface, right? You would just remove the name, you would take everything that's in there, and you can put it here into that, into that uh, type uh, and annotation, basically. Wouldn't look practical, but it would work. And based on that, the compiler will find that, oh yeah, the list actually has a size. Okay, great, I can compile it. Uh, very important distinction as opposed to ducted typing. This happens properly at the compile time. Right? Always? 
Shoot. What if I have a, I know, an object or any value? That is that the, if you have an object and it, which doesn't, doesn't have a side, then it, it will not come back. Yeah. Just the question, what about polymorphism? If you have uh, the same parameter and then you have some some class which wraps the uh, object that has the parameters or which, which method is so, or which signature is preferred, the more specific one, the more general one. So, for example, if you have an apple, an apple has, has size and you put something in, mm -hmm. an apple, so is the, is the method preferred that has the size type hint or the method preferred that has the apple type hint? You, you know what I mean? You can have more, more, more than one more, you can have more than one function with such a type hint. And both are valid. So you only need the name and the verse. So it's, it's, not based on the type. it's based on the name and the type. So I think what happens, uh, but correct me if I write, but how I, if I go, but how I will do it. <laughs> <laughs> but correct me also if I write. <laughs> Sorry. That this is just an anonymous interface. And when you are calling, you have a static type, not the dynamic type, you have a static yeah, type. Exactly, yeah. And you can just check if the anonymous interface is a subset of the static exactly. type. Yeah, but and if it's not a subset, it's an error. Yeah. If but it's a subset, it's okay. And basically, how was that static type constructed prior to that is a different story, right? So you yeah. say, oh, I'm mixing things together, and like, okay, that's a different question, but. After that construction, you end up with some sort of static type, and that's going to have some sort of methods. And then, if you find this one, then for combat. That's that's how. It yeah, the point is, uh, object can have two members or two. Yeah. So it no. is. It really matters. So it's not based on type. If if you have an object which has two integers, yeah. one of them is size. Yeah. Can be both of them size. One is size, yeah. the other is the other English word, yeah. and the other English word doesn't matter if you use the size. Okay. So it's 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 a so I said it's not nominal, but it's nominal when it comes to the method name, of course. So it doesn't care about method the, the name of the underlying type, but of course it's looking for that particular method. And by the way, we can kind of go back to the also in Haskell and Scala how the you know the monadic uh, notation sugar is implemented. Well, that's pretty much what it does, right? It looks for the bind, it looks for the map, it looks for these methods. It's like, oh, is it there? And if it's there, it's gonna it's gonna compile it and it's gonna. Do the do the. It's gonna turn the the notation sugar or the four four notation sugar into into the sequence of, of binds or flat maps or whatever is there. So this is actually a similar method mechanism. It's it's gonna look for that specific method with specific. And the time is really compared as is. There's no sort of it's not okay to have a method that has a super type of the type that you're requesting. No, look, this this mm -hmm. type has to have the method. That's it. Nothing. Oh. Like, and of course, if you if this is a subtype of a super type that has that method, it's gonna work. Right. Because if the super type doesn't matter, then then the type doesn't. Yeah, but I was my meaning the comparison Sorry. between the, the actual. Yeah, not not the object being cast, uh -huh. but the, the function that you could call it on. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Forget it. Well, that's that's it. So I think it's an act. Yeah, it's structural danger. So just yeah. just like you basically how I how I remember it always is like just like if you have anonymous functions lambdas right they have everything but no name these are anonymous types they have everything they have structure but they don't, they have no name mm -hmm. same thing. and you match that. Oh, but that's quite a bit different right because you know in in terms of you don't check for the quality of. Of, of the type, right? So it's, no. like, it's like an interface. It's really something it's like that an interface, can be yeah. implemented, but it's not necessarily you know, something. Yeah, you agree that this but, is something. But in, a, in an OOP world, it actually makes sense because in an OOP world, this is what you are doing yeah. all the time, right? Because yeah, yeah, you yeah. can have a subtype anyway, so you're just always uh, checking for the subset. Is, so actually, it's perfectly perfectly normal in the OOP sense. But I guess the, the big difference here is that this doesn't know about this anonymous type. Yes. Of this interface. Yeah, it so doesn't know anything. Structured, like you say. And one fun thing is that this is exactly how the interfaces work in Go. And they got a whole lot of publicity based on this. Like everybody was so impressed and so happy yeah. about this thing. So it's very fun for me to see now. So that, Scala has a. Yeah, it probably exists now in a ten years before. Maybe it existed also in somewhere else. I don't think they invented it, but for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure not. It's, uh, somebody, somebody else did. Yeah. So yeah. it's called structural typing again. Could you give a name to this little thing in the code of races that says def size int? 
could you just sort of like make it a name interface and then the list that has never seen this interface and doesn't declare that it implements it will still satisfy this in interface? Does that concept exist? You can well, if, you, if you name it, then you suddenly have a normal... No, no, the, the question is that... So this, this is exactly a very good question because I, so I, 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 was, I was thinking about the same, that I, I said that this is a only the interface and it is not exactly the that you are saying. Mm -hmm. And so the question is that if we name this anonymous thing, uh -huh. so, we, so we go in the line previous and we give it a name, that interface something equals this. Yeah. So then can we, can we say then one more parenthesis count table colon inter, new interface name? Or then it's an error because then it will say that this not, doesn't implement the new Exactly, then it's an error because then you would enable nominal type checking and so suddenly, yeah, this doesn't implement so the So this interface. is something more than It is this. something more, yes. Well, you have to type it. That's interesting. This should be a type. I mean, curly brace and, and then the fields, isn't that just a type? And you can do a type Alice. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. What, yeah. he's saying that will not work. So, so, some, so somehow the curly brace is triggering. So the I, I see. I see. I think I see what's happening. So okay. Okay. Now what's happening here is that normally with nominal typing, if you imagine oh this doesn't exist, okay, we have normal nominal typing, very classic. The entire type checking is is based on the checking of the type hierarchy, right? Are you the subtype of the the thing that is called Joe, right? So this is all about the names and the sub names of the subtypes. But this is actually outside of the entire world. So we are outside yeah. of the of the of the type hierarchy. We don't care about that at all. This is more like a kind of small talk idea that oh, you get a message and like oh, can you can you understand this message that's called size? And if you can, then you can. Get and, the, and, yeah, and, and the question was that can we trigger this clever mechanism if we have a name? So if I have a name for an interface, can I say before the interface name duck or something and then it's yeah. triggered? I think if you if you name it and if you in the type annotation if you specify the name, you would then jump into back into the nominal yeah. OOP type resolution system and it would actually not work. Yeah. That so that's that's the implicit conversion there, right? So to make list actually fulfilling the new interface, you could use the implicit conversion to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You could, you could, yes, you could do that. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So that was a little structural typing and now it's a crazier thing than that. So for all the all the Node.js people who are not here, if they complain that if they go to Scala or something and they will miss their dynamic typing so much that they can't sleep, Scala actually has dynamic dynamic typing. Please don't tell this to anyone. <laughs> yeah, hi. So it has a, there is a, there is a language feature called dynamics, and if you extend this kind of dynamic trait, or what is it? Then you can basically do the late binding at runtime time of, of whatever keywords are thrown at the object. So if somebody does accept is the name of the object, if somebody does accept dot something, this is being called select dynamic, wait, name is something, and then you have a code that decides what to do about that. So you can actually have a dynamic typing if you really want to. This is that so. Yeah, I never tried it, but I mean, I tried it as, a, as an experiment, it works perfectly. And I actually know one library that uses it for for <coughs> JavaScript like the JSON parsing. So even in JavaScript, JSON is a native object, so you just do dot dot. So that library uses the dynamic typing in Scala to get the same semantics. So you get the JSON object when you like dot request, dot, you know, whatever. So it's super thing. convenient for some test cases or something where I want to Pretty convenient, I guess, yeah. Little scary, but yeah, convenient. So Actually, it's got support then. It's, 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 it's called it typing, right? right? This is not dispatch. Uh, sorry? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a dispatch. Yeah, so. Why do they call it typing? No, I don't. It's, it's more like a dispatch, alright. But uh, as, I would say, as opposed to the set typing, because the type checking is not really performed there at all, right? So really, your code is to decide, but the is more like a dispatch. So will a dynamic object satisfy structural type constraint? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this uh, particular, this interface, this is set. So you can't do anything with it. You, know, you can't put structural types in there or anything. You have to use that as it is. So.
This is just a special special bank to use if you want to have this Oops. kind of dynamic resolution. Just to understand it better. So huh? how can I how can I uh, return something else than a hint? Can we return again? Right? Yeah, uh, this is only an example. You can also output something else. So hmm. it's going to still take a name as a string, as in whatever you're calling, and then yeah. you basically can overload it by return type. Or you can curry. Yeah. You can so you, can this, you return a function. So how does it decide it means, does it often need a help with the resolving which one to call? So apart, I don't think you can just decide what you're going to output. So it has to be some type, right? You can that's not dynamic. But once you decide what it's going to be it wants to be statically, you can actually choose anything. Okay. So if you want to like to output I don't know, XML document in there, sure. you can just this. But it's always going to be XML document. Right, so I think mean, this is quite easy in terms of naming it. So there are some other types and features that we, I don't want to go into because they are exotic and not very often used. Body classes. Body classes are a nice, a nice optimization. Yeah. I mean, it's just like so much. I'm super surprised. Uh, you, you, you want me to compile it to, to treat some data and not as not by reference, but. <coughs> yeah, and I don't know, they want to have it in Java 10, right? Or something like that. Um, I don't think they are in Java 10, maybe. I'm pretty sure they are not going to be in that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's why I say it's a So here they are. So this is being used in standard library at all, like as an optimization for all kinds of IO and everything. And types of solution that's another optimization. So yeah, this is. Uh, so I would like to end with some um, practical considerations. So as I like, as I look at uh, both languages, the first look at Haskell. I mean, this is a really kind of a opening for a discussion because there are so many considerations, right? But when I look at Haskell, I see a language where you can have a great productivity because it's very powerful. It's very performant. I would, by top performance, I mean it's well. Haskell code can run, can run really, really quickly, right? So it shouldn't be a problem. Color community. So there's actually this trick of uh, if you want to hire good software engineers, you just can start doing something in Haskell, and then the Haskell people come, and suddenly you're a good software engineer. So it works. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, strong theoretical foundations. There's also a good library and tooling ecosystem. There is only a dreaded learning curve. I don't know if it's real or imagined, but uh, there is a certain understanding in the industry that, oh, Pascal, this is too difficult. Like, we are not going to go for that. Right, so that's an open question. It's too difficult or not. And Scala actually is kind of in a similar position, slightly different. I would say that productivity, performance, all the community is surprisingly, again, with Clever, I was surprised that everybody is just pushing the very abstract functional stuff. Like, of course, oh yeah, the imperative stuff is there, but nobody really cares. Uh, we already have seen some, some consequences of the pollution that the Java interoperability, of, of interoperability uh, causes in the language. This is probably one of the, the most controversial, controversial design decision. On the other, other hand, what the decision did for them is that, well, they're compatible with Java. You have so many Java shops and JVM, JVM companies and JVM platforms and JVM everything, so that's a big deal. You have the best library and tooling ecosystem without questions, just so much stuff out there. And the transition to the language from uh, somebody who's writing Java, C++, or C Sharp, it's actually really easy. Even if you start a project and uh, you have a bunch of people and they have like zero interest or experience in functional programming, then worst, worst come to worst, if you want to ship it, you just tell them, okay, just, just write it so it works. <coughs> they write it. And it's probably still going to be better than if they worked it in C++. <laughs> For sure, I would say. Because the language is, that system is sound and everything. And then gradually, they can learn to, to use more and more powerful abstractions and get better at it. So this is actually kind of a nice, smooth transition. I think this is the, I think this is the business model that they, they had in mind when they, when they uh, also founded the company that, uh, that runs Scala. That, oh yeah, so it's not going to be as 
quite as cool as Haskell, but it's going to be cool enough and powerful enough, and uh, in many in many cases actually equally powerful. And we are we are on the AVM, and if you are a Java guy or if you are a C++, uh, C++ guy, then you can just start, and that's a powerful. I, I mean, I I actually admire that kind of practical you know, thinking. Because this was also a story of Java, if you remember how Java started. It was uh, they specifically designed it with all the bad decisions actually to to pull the C programmers into it, and it worked. So that's something. To, yeah, sure. Can you do the trick where you just deploy a Java in the middle of the big Java project, and then you can code in your little Scala bottle? This is exactly what totally, totally, totally works. Right. Yeah. And done it. So yeah, you can have your Java project, you can have your Maven build, you can have your whatever Gradle you are using, and yes, you can just go, oh, here's my Scala compiler plugin, and it's just going to produce another jar, and it's a part of your system, and this is this is great for these big companies. Like, like wow. We are it's, it's all just. Uh, it's it's really seamless, right? So, so if you tell them that, oh yeah, I'm not happy that the null is still there, and I'm not, I'm not happy about the, about the equality which is not typed, they will tell you, all right, do but but we can actually deploy this thing without spending two two hundred million for changing everything. So that's about, something to do. About the JVM, JVM doesn't do tail optimization. No, so that's the like, problem. So I, on purpose, I wasn't talking about implementation issues much, just really strictly the language, but yes, you're right. If you try to do a, like a really monadic style of programming in Scala, you know, compounding monads all the time, you might run kind of out of stack because, uh, yeah, uh, the JVM can do DCO only uh, inside of the method. So if you, you know, if two methods call each other. So self recursive Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. In, so. in, in, in short approach, I yeah, so, so it can do some basically only local limited limited DCO within one method. If if one method calls itself, then yes. Right. But if two methods do this like ping pong style, right. then it's kind of, and a lot of Scala libraries they use dirty tricks like trampolines to go around this, you know, you need like libraries like Scala Z or CAS which implement all these monadic constructs which are now from Haskell libraries and they use all kinds of tricks to, to avoid these pitfalls. Right, but yeah. because you don't actually need any more like stuff, right? You can have just mutual recursive functions, pure functions, no more else involved, and it's going to And still, stuff. if you, yeah, you're right. If you basically, if you just compose a lot of functions, yeah, then you can get into trouble. So that's a bit of an issue. I think they are going to work on this, but uh, I'm not sure what is the what is the current plan for the next release. I don't think in the next release probably probably going to change. So yeah, that's a, that's an implementation issue in some projects. But typically, pretty well solved by, with uh, with these advanced libraries, so they can help. If you if you run into such an issue, you use a library that, that can help with that. Is, is, there, yeah. is there a project to give Scala nice syntax? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. No, no, yeah, you're right. You know, to get rid of the extra parentheses that shouldn't no, be there. No, no, the extra parentheses. So when, when you show, for example, the data, then I was just thinking that the data yeah. tree, the data tree. Oh, yeah, it's very good. I can go back that's, to that. What's, what's very good about Haskell yeah, yeah. is that is that modeling stuff is very very non verbose, very concise. Yes. So so you can you can understand well the I, I I will not claim that you understand it more quickly, but, but in Haskell you can keep at least right you more. keep yourself occupied but for five hours looking mm -hmm. Looking without scrolling. This is what you meant, right? Yeah. So, so if, if you have data that data tree and you have forty lines of that, and that is your that there is the specification of your. There project, are some right? libraries. I don't quite recall the names, but there are some libraries that give you a very concise syntax for modeling this kind of algebraic data types or right. type classes. So also type classes are normally more more verbose, but there is a library that can you know, just give <coughs> annotations like type class and suddenly it looks like Haskell. Right? Yeah. So yeah, there are some efforts, but. I wouldn't say there are efforts, uh, I, at least I didn't detect, I don't know anything, everything about the Scala development, and sometimes I read something, right? But I don't, don't think there are major efforts in the, language, in the language itself, like, oh yeah, let's make this, let's make the AEDs a first class citizen, right? Let's make it like a super easy syntax. I don't think there is these efforts. But there are libraries as always, so I guess the answer is kind of a middle ground. But that's a good question, of course. This is also, also something I like about Haskell that things you use a lot, they have a very clean syntax.
Yeah, exactly. So, so that based on this example, I'm not really uh, sure that I will just want to write Java instead. Uh, all on that on that uh, part, you can totally believe me that you don't want to Java, write Java instead. You know that uh, the project is. <coughs> is uh, this in Java is going to be like triple lines of code here, right? Easy. So. Uh, so, you know, the dis the deciding between copy constructors. I would put it like this. Project uh, on both parameterization. Yeah. You might or might not believe me, but uh, deciding between Haskell and Scala, it's a funny, funny discussion. Maybe with Haskell and having a little advantage. Deciding between Java and Scala is no discussion. Uh, <laughs> it's pointless. Uh, your Scala is going to be so much more productive like this. Yeah, the language is so much more expressive. Java is going to be what a series of instances of. How are the tools? Tools, uh, well, since uh, the primary stuff is on JVM, then the tools are great because you can reuse most of it already exists for JVM world, you know, all the profi profilers, everything. But my, I, mean, in, I mean, in the middle of a match in IntelliJ, does it tell me what do I still have to write, but I don't match yet? IntelliJ Scala plugin is actually pretty good, yeah. yeah. I use it and uh, I've never failed to wonder it. Very, very nice. I mean, sometimes it doesn't work, right? sometimes it gets stuck on something, but generally speaking, it's uh, one of the more pleasant or the most pleasant experiences in programming. Mm -hmm. So you get the, all this completion, you get uh, introspection, you can uh, you can query the types of every expression. It's it's very <coughs> very very helpful. That's another thing I actually like. This is one thing I I miss actually when I write Pascal. This is one thing I miss this this great IDE help that you know you. Just start typing, and it's gonna find uh, everything for you, and uh, all, all the functions that could, all the methods that could be there. That, that's that's really helpful. There is also a Haskell plugin actually for IntelliJ, but it's not as powerful. It's quite nice, but not nearly as powerful as uh, as Pascal, for example. So that, on that front, uh, there is no problem. That works really well. What I would say is that problem and problems uh, because I want to also talk about problems. So apart from these. The funny little things in the language that you already mentioned. The implementation problems is the yeah the, the lack of the internet PCO, lack of the global PCO in the JVM implementation that can cause problems sometimes. I don't think it's like super big deal because okay if you hit that problem then you will solve it with the library. It's not going to block your project completely, but it's a stupid thing to hit it. And the, what could be also a little problem is that the Scala compiler currently is relatively slow, not horribly slow, but could be faster. They are now working on it, as far as I know. They are trying to optimize the compiler and everything, so with the next release, people expect that it would be snapping up. So <coughs> compared to JC, as a compare? I guess it's 10 times faster still. Compared to what? Compared to JC, can you have a compiler? Uh, I mean, it's similarly sized programs. So yeah, it, it's going to be slow. Maybe not dramatically slow, but it's going to be slow. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. I was thinking that you are saying it's slower than Java. Uh, no, so it's not it's definitely slower, slower than Java. Yeah. Yeah, definitely slower than Java. Java is but Java, compa Java compiler doesn't do anything, right? It's just very simple. Oh. Uh, very little, not much work. As far as I know, JetBrains uh, had their own Scala compiler. Mm, possibly. So maybe, that's why, all, maybe that's why it works so well. All introspection, all for completion. Ah, that, that might explain why it works so well, yeah. But with the Scala compiler, it's not doing that huge amount either, right? Because well, it's not actually generating the, the, the code or optimizing you know, the back end. It's the actually doing some optimizations as far as I know. But only for the kind of it's like a front end for JSC, right? It's, it's doing some, like, some lining, some of some of right. these optimizations, up, come up to like, subscription elimination, whatever. And it's doing all these implicit searches and stuff, and it's, uh, of course, doing all the type level computation. Right. Because the type level, it's you know, we, have, we are talking about the type system which is of similar power than in Haskell, so you can really have type level computation where you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. What does it do with mining? Why? Yes. Well, it decides that this is a good idea. To sure, but the JVM is them. also doing the mining. Yeah, but uh, they have found out that in some cases JVM just <coughs> can't do it with some construct and some, some closures. So this is just some talk I saw somewhere that they, they realized that, oh yeah, yeah there is a mining, but Somehow we should maybe do it a bit earlier. Or... So they're trying to basically, I would say, the, J, uh, the JVM is doing some set of optimizations at some at some times, and they're trying to do a complement 
I, I guess one of the things is that if you inline at the scale level, then they can use whatever high level invariants they have to optimize. Oh, and also, they have more information, right? Because there is it's not erased right. anymore. It's not erased. Yeah, this is much more so that could be another another yeah. reason why yeah. why it makes sense to actually do inlining. I know there is now a lot of work being done on the on the optimizer and on the compiler itself. So it's probably going to get faster. I'm just saying that it's uh, if you compare it to the Java compiler, which is very quick, well, yeah. this is certainly slower. It does much more work. But otherwise, the tooling, I mean, the tooling is perfectly fine. Yeah, so, especially if uh, people have experience from uh, Java world, it's no problem. Everything works. You can even have your Scala project in your Gradle or whatever build system people use. And, so. and there are also, like, just like in Haskell, you know, you have these projects like Fredge, which is a subset of Haskell and JVM. And there is also some, there are some compilers for Haskell for JavaScript. So the same, the same can be applied for Scala, so there is Scala.js, which is actually a really good project. Like, I, I like to watch it and like, what they are doing because they seem to be super clever. And they are combining the Scala to, uh, to JavaScript. And there is also a Scala native project, which would be like uh, close to the Haskell compiler, compiling to the native code. So who knows what will happen, right? Maybe eventually they will actually go native, but they went with the JVM at the beginning. And that decision costs something, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, this kind of I also the reverse project. There's a GHCVM, it's a summer code project. Oh, the GHCVM as well, yes. To have right. uh, GHC, yeah. or a JVM backend for GHC. JVM backend for GHC, yes. Oh, so this kind of, kind of like both, both communities are attacking the problem from the same front, I would say. It's just the starting position is somewhere else. Yeah. Okay, so I guess. Yeah, so that's the the presentation at least what I have to say. Thanks for the question. That was a